Welcome to the Black Sparrow Media Internet Broadcast Network. Listening to Linux in the Hamshack. LHS is a podcast about Linux, open source, and amateur radio for everyone. Now, here are your hosts Russ, K5TUX, Cheryl, W5MOO, and Bill, NE4RD. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome. You have tuned in to episode number 463 of Linux in the Hamshack, the most terrific amateur radio podcast on the internet. And this is our short topics edition for getting on to be mid to late April of 2022. We're glad you joined us. And before we jump into our topics for tonight, let's go ahead and introduce ourselves. I'm Russ K5TUX. I'm Cheryl W5MOO. And I'm Bill NE4RD. Yay, the gang is all here, and Bill is spending his last few days in Ireland, and then he'll come back to the States and be disappointed, and life will be back to normal. So, <laughs> <laughs> and you'll have to go back and start doing all the things you used to do, like filing your taxes and all that good uh, stuff. I already did that. Uh, <laughs> don't get me started. <laughs> Let's not get you started. Let's instead get started with some amateur radio topics. How about that? You can start with that. It's a lot more entertaining than than talking about filing taxes and sending all your money to the government. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Well, let's start with this very first topic, and it's uh, AWRL employment opportunities. Hey, here's some opportunities for you. Uh, The AWRL is sinking candidates for job opportunities at its headquarters in Newington, Connecticut. Available positions include the Director of Information Technology, which I'll I'll tell you it's been open for quite a while, (laughs) because I think I even sent a a thing in there for it. But anyway, uh, uh, Public Relations and Outreach Manager, Social Media Strategist, and others. The AWRL Human Resources Manager, Lucy uh, uh, Goodwin, explained that some of the jobs are brand new positions established to help advance the association's ongoing digital transformation across membership programs, services, and publishing. Uh, some of the, quote, some of the positions are responsible for increasing awareness and the growth of amateur radio, said Goodwin. A new program area will expand the AWRL's visibility in promoting ham radio to the public and through our outreach <laughs> to like-minded communities, end quote. Uh, a list of open positions, including the responsibilities and qualifications for each job, is posted at the uh, awrl.org slash careers link. Employment opportunities are available for candidates with or without amateur radio license. Uh, quote, we're always on the lookout for experienced radio amateurs who want to contribute to uh, contribute their passion for ham radio to the AWRL HQ team, added Goodwin. Uh, to apply, submit your resume to the AWRL Human Resources, and the AWRL is an equal opportunity employer. So if you've uh, ever wanted to uh, move to Connecticut, right, <laughs> uh, this could be an opportunity and also, uh, you know, have a job inside the AWRL and, uh, you know, participate in the hobby uh, in a uh, more uh, in employment way, <laughs> especially if you're not employed using your ham radio-ness. Yes, absolutely. And is there any employer that is not an equal opportunity employer at this point? Can you even not be one? <laughs> I think you, uh, you, you would probably, uh, get in trouble if you were not an you know, EEOC or whatever, you know, everything, all that other good stuff that they need to have as an employer in the United States. Yeah, I would think so too. So I'm not sure why everyone continues to say that. Maybe that's part of the requirement of being one. I don't know. But anyway, yeah. yeah, check it out if you want to be part of the AWRL. I, I'm not even a part of the AWRL right now. My membership lapsed. I got to take care of that. So, um, <laughs> yeah, one of those things I need to do. One of the many, many things. Speaking of many things that need to be done, before Cheryl gets too deep into whatever she's doing over there, she has to read a story. <laughs> I'm not, not going to let it slide, so... <laughs> <laughs> My mumble window was like buried among thirty others. So. <laughs> it's like, wait, wait, it's here somewhere. Crap, where is it? 
All right, fine. I'll read something, I guess. Yeah, yeah. You need to do that. All right. So our next story is Erie Amateur Radio Operator Faces More Charges of Airing Bomb and Other Threats. And the story reads, an eerie man accused of using an emergency radio frequency to broadcast threats against people and property and to air bogus weather and other emergencies in 2021 and earlier this year was given two big breaks during recent court appearances. Richard L. Wagner, 61, had faced 37 criminal charges, including multiple counts of bomb threats, and two criminal cases that Erie County detectives filed against him in October and in February. But prosecutors dropped all but two charges, one first-degree misdemeanor count of terroristic threats in each case at Wagner's preliminary hearing on March 3rd. Wagner waived these two charges to court. The second break came on March 22nd when Erie County Judge David Ridge agreed to change the $250,000 bond holding Wagner in the Erie County prison uh, in the second case to a $25,000 unsecured bond. Ridge placed conditions on the bond, however, including a prohibition against the misuse of any communications device and the removal of Wagner's radio equipment from his home. Wagner could lose both of those deals after county detectives accused him of airing, earlier this week, a series of new threats over emergency airwaves. Apparently, he just doesn't learn. Apparently not. (laughs) I don't know what what makes people do stupid things like this, but I don't know. must just be boredom, honestly. But yeah, I sure. can't imagine. Or, or he's a <laughs> psychopath or something like that. I I'm <laughs> leaning more towards that. So, ah, <laughs> uh, well, at least they didn't cut him any slack this time. So, oh, right. well, it looks like the that's that's iffy because he was pulling his nonsense again. So, yeah, so, go, we'll see. Came from the source, go eerie. I don't know yeah. if I want to go eerie at this place. <laughs> go eerie or go home. Yeah. <laughs> and if you're, of course, if you're in eerie, then that is home. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Where is this, though? Is this you're eerie, eerie, Pennsylvania, obviously. Okay. Well, there's other eeries across the world, so. Yeah, there's eerie Ohio, too, right? It's yeah, eerie County. So. Yeah. So. It's somewhere in that general part of the world, though, I'm sure. All right, so moving on, let's talk about DEF CON. Yeah, it's a conference that I've been in Las Vegas during the time of, but have never attended because I was there for a different conference. But uh, one of these days I wouldn't mind going to DEF CON, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, Ham Radio isn't, well, let me read the, st- the title first. Ham Radio Village and Exams return to DEF CON 30. Ham Radio isn't just what your grandpa does in the shed out back. <laughs> <laughs> we really want to know what Grandpa does in the shed out back. <laughs> well, you know, he's always talking about taking you out to the shed. <laughs> well, that's uh, true, and you never know where you're going to come back from. <laughs> uh, radios are an important piece of technology we use every day, and amateur radio has been at the forefront of its development since day one. We are some of the original hardware hackers. Yes, we are. DIY exploration and sharing has always been a vital part of our community, and the goal of Ham Radio Village is to nurture this growth into the next generation with all the amazing people at DEF CON. Our village will have demos, talks, presentations, contests, and, of course, license exams. So come visit Ham Radio Village to learn more about the hobby, including how antennas work and how to build your own, how to actually use that software to find radio sitting on the shelf, how to track down a rogue transmitter with a handheld radio, and how you can illegally transmit 1,500 watts into the airwaves after taking a simple multiple-choice test. One of the unique things about ham radio is that it goes deep into the theory and science of radio. This knowledge unlocks a whole new level of understanding about why and how radios work and radio waves propagate. We just about everything. Uh, I think that's with, with just about everything. Uh, uh. <laughs> Obviously, I have not had enough to drink today. One mimosa is not cutting it so far. Um, where were we? With, with just, just about, yeah, with just about everything containing some sort of radio these days, this information can help us better research, attack, and defend all things that emit RF. For example, just about anyone can build an antenna with simple hardware. And sometimes you don't even need hardware. You just hook two leads to your, you know, your uh, yard chaise long. <laughs> you can probably get on six meters. Uh <laughs> 
Uh, having an understanding of the fundamentals allows you to troubleshoot and tune the performance of that antenna to pick up the exact signals you want while filtering out the rest. And actually, I had a question about that I'm going to throw out here in a second. Uh, Def Con 30 is August 11th through the 14th, 2022 at Caesars Forum in Flamingo, Harrah's, and Link in Las Vegas. So all over Las Vegas, apparently. And yeah. that came from the Def Con Forums. So cool. So I was thinking about this the other day. I was talking about the fact that I have an antenna to put up or an antenna array, if you will, for yeah. my repeater that's going to be going on the air at some point in the near future. Um, and we were talking about whether or not to just um, do, you know, to live with the descents of the antennas being sort of relatively close together, even if uh, further than one wavelength apart, or to try and find some cans to do, you know, the, the duplexing. Yeah. But would wouldn't a wouldn't a bandpass filter on the transmit antenna also work or the receive antenna? Sorry, to bandpass for what? Because on four forty so, so, you shouldn't need cans because they're five megahertz apart. No, this is going to be on two meters. But I mean, just to <laughs> to notch out the transmit frequency on the receive antenna. No, I don't. I don't think you could. I mean, that's the point of the can. That's what the can is doing. It's basically a notch filter. So it notches out the, uh, or, you know, gives you a notch where the input is. So right. it, uh, has very sharp edges. So it takes out where the transmitter is coming in. So, I mean, basically you're doing that. Um, but, but like a bandpass filter is not tunable to that type of, uh, that type of, uh, sharpness. You can't, isn't there something s smaller and simpler you could use as a notch filter than cans? I mean, cause cans are not cheap generally. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I don't, I, because you're so close in band, uh, I'm not sure. Um, I, I really think cans are the only way to go on two meters just because you're, you're only six, what, 600 kilocycles apart. Right. Is that right? Yeah. Point yes. Six, point point six, six megahertz. megahertz. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you need, a, it needs to be super sharp. Uh, I mean, even still, they're not super sharp, <laughs> but they're sharp enough where they can cut that off. Um, yeah. So yeah, you'll, you'll see that most bandpass filters are not, if it's not like a lot of power, that's why I said, if you're running at like five Watts, you probably can just get away with not doing anything. Um, but if you go up to, you know, 25 to 50 to a hundred or something like that, you're going to start desensing the input. For right. sure. But does that uh, really matter if you're desensing the input? Because no one should be, you know what I mean? Well, it whatever's can lock coming it to a state open, though. That's the thing. It could desense itself to the point that it actually intermods and it kicks off itself. <laughs> so it never shuts off. And it'll just okay. yeah. end, end the life of the repeater. <laughs> yeah, the finals will just go out, you know. Uh uh, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know. I mean, cans are really the safest, safest way to go or low power, one or the other. Yeah. Well, um, I want to run it at 50 watts. So yeah, I'm, I'm sure other people have opinions on that. Uh, a duplex remember, duplex remember. What does that mean? Yeah, it's full duplex. So it's going off at the same time. Yeah. It's transmitting and receiving all at once. That's the point of the cans is that you it won't hear it. Right. <clears throat> Yeah. Mm. Okay. Well, th there it is. So. <laughs> yeah, I think it would be problematic. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Well, let's move on from our amateur radio topics and uh, quick discussion into the world of open source. And uh, I think we're back around to you, Bill. So you can pick up the first story. Sure. Sure. Yeah. This is Pi No More. Uh, since its launch, the Raspberry Pi OS, the most uh, and most operating systems based on it, has shipped with the default. Pi user account. That's the PI user account, uh, making it simpler to boot up the Pi and start working without the needing to hook up the device to a monitor or go through multi-step step setup process. But as of today, that's changing. New installs of Raspberry Pi OS are shedding the default user account for both security and regulatory reasons. Uh, the Raspberry Pi Foundation software engineer Simon Long explains the thinking in a recent blog post. Uh, in quotes, the Pi user account could potentially make brute force attacks slightly easier. And in response to this, some countries are now introducing legislation 
to forbid any internet connected device from having default login credentials, he writes. And there's more to this story, obviously, over on the article on Ars Technica. But, uh, yeah, this is probably a, a good deal. Because, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I remember people hacking into devices that had, you know, set passwords and, and usernames. And, uh, I mean, this got, uh, even what MongoDB and a bunch of other <laughs> internet exposed things, uh, you know, in the same kind of trouble, uh, along their, uh, their growth uh, in the product. So it was about time that Raspberry Pi finally grew up and uh, shedded the default user account and expect their users to be somewhat more sophisticated and actually establish a user. <laughs> Name and password for your device uh, when you when you initialize it. And I've actually always found the Pi user on Raspberry Pi is annoying as hell. I, I hate the fact that that's the default login. So, um, yeah. So this sounds like a good idea to me. Yeah, All long right. time coming. Yeah, I think so. And I and I'm not really sure. I guess just because they wanted a static image on the Pi thing, so there wasn't a lot of. Uh, tomfoolery going on during the install process, like setting usernames and stuff like that, is probably why they avoided this at the beginning. But I, I think it's time has really come. So, all right. Well, we should probably bring Cheryl in one more time, so we're not, uh, so you don't have to do double duty on some of these stories, and uh, we'll let her handle this one since it looks pretty straightforward. I hear, I hear the scroll wheel going. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good sign. So, so she's uh, she's getting to the right spot in the etherpad. So. Am I? The uh, thing is, I don't know where I'm at. Well, Pop OS. Pop OS one. The, <laughs> That's the first what I one. figured. Yeah. No, not the first one. The first one's Pi No More. No, no, no. no. The first Pop OS story. There's, there's oh, two. Oh, gotcha. Go so. <laughs> okay, gotcha. <laughs> All right, whatever. So, okay. So our next one is Pop OS teases intrepid Linux users with the 22.04 beta release. The developers have made beta images available on the Pop OS GitHub page, though they warn that this release is beta and that users should therefore expect bugs. For patient users eager to get a taste of the upcoming release, there are two versions, one that supports AMD and Intel graphics adapters, and another with proprietary NVIDIA drivers for System76 built PCs. The biggest change from the last version is the presence of newer user interface elements. The new version uses a customized version of GNOME 42, itself a new release. Under this hood, it also uses version 5.16 of the Linux kernel. This is one small increment higher than the mainline Ubuntu 22.04 LTS, which uses version 5.15. Since both of these distributions are still in beta, the composition of the software might change in the final release. System76 has heavily modified the GNOME desktop to appeal to creative professionals in STEM, otherwise known as science, technology, energy, engineering, excuse me, and mathematics workers. Their changes have focused on tiling windows automatically to maximize the efficiency of screen real estate. And this came from Make Use Of. All right. I was, hey, another uh, philosophical question that we can probably answer real quick. You, you mentioned the term STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And I heard that there's a new thing where they're trying to call it STEAM and adding the A in for arts. For arts. Yeah, that's been that yeah. way for probably like the last four years. <laughs> okay. No, no, no. Yeah. It, it's, so it's, it's not new. It's not about it being new. It's about the oh, fact okay. that I thought the idea of STEM was that we were trying to outline a, a group of learning um goals that were not arts basically they were so so why are we trying to roll arts back in <laughs> um well i can i can put it in another way um you can actually look at uh at, i believe the arrl's definition of ham radio or something like that and i believe it talks about the art and science of amateur radio and um science is quite an art in itself. And I think that might be more of the angle that they're going with with the steam, not necessarily just um art in general. And then you also have uh all the computer generated art, which requires uh quite a bit of uh understanding of technology and everything else. So there is a component of art definitely in science and technology for sure. Okay. 
Fair enough, but and I'm not fractals. sure. Fractals. Come on, fractals, mathematics. No, 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 no. I understand that. <laughs> but but the term art or arts and sciences or art of science um, have, have been around a long time, too. It just it seems like it's being it's like overloading for no reason. But <sighs> yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's I can I don't know the origin of when that started specifically. <laughs> <laughs> but uh i see a lot of uh a lot of cohesion between art and the rest of those topics in a multitude of ways um if it's just to say oh no arts like in liberal arts i, I don't see that so it wouldn't be still still stalam i think you could definitely say uh arts belongs in there um because yeah art can be mathematical art you know we've seen this a lot <laughs> <laughs> engineering artwork, you know, paint jobs that they do on cars where they, you know, basically take a string and hang a paint thing around and make these concentric circles. And um, there's something mathematical about that as well. And then we all know that, you know, digital art, pixel art and everything else like that is, of course, technology. And then, uh, yeah, science, you know, plotting and everything else that we, we visualize data. Um, and that is an art in itself. I actually, okay. I actually looked up STEM versus STEAM, and it says STEM focuses explicitly on hard scientific the- or technological engineering and mathematical skills, wherein STEAM students leverage both hard and soft skills to solve the problems. So... Yeah, that seems weak. My, my yeah, explanation well, is better. Yeah, well, your, your explanation is better, but yeah, I can I can see where they they mix in the art aspect of it to. I, I just kind of thought it was already in there and didn't need to be explicitly iterated, but right, whatever. That's well, just me. you know, Steam you know deals with language arts, dance, drama, etc., where STEM is specifically yeah. scientific. Yeah, and I thought that was the original distinction. That's why I'm not sure why it's trying to we're trying to roll arts back in. But anyway, uh Don says because when there's only stem and not steam you end up with Facebook. <laughs> and that's a very good thing right there. <laughs> uh cuz there's an art to being a douchebag. <laughs> uh, yeah. All right. So let's move on and talk about <laughs> RM Lint, which is a deduping the Linux file system utility. It's uh, released under the GPL v3, and it finds wasted space and other broken things on your file system and offers to remove it. That's kind of a useful thing, it sounds like. It's able to find duplicate files and directories, non-stripped binaries. Now, we've never really talked about stripping binaries on this or, or anything like that, but... No. <laughs> um, basically, that is like a blob of text or a blob of data that has a bunch of text in it. If you ever, if you ever run the command strings on a binary, you'll see those things that can generally be stripped out because they're not useful to the binary. They're just human readable junk. Uh, so apparently, this can do that. It can fix broken sim links, remove empty files, recurse empty directories or recursively remove empty directories, I'm assuming is what that means, and fix files with broken users or group IDs. I'd, I'd be interested to know how it's handling that, because how does it know it's broken? <laughs> <laughs> um, so key features include the fact that it's extremely fast, it's flexible and easy to use with command line options that apparently are intuitive. It has a choice of several hashes for hash hash-based duplicate detection, that's nice. Uh, option for exact byte to byte comparison, which is slightly slower than hash based, has numerous output options, assuming debugging and things like that. Option to store time of last run. Next time we'll only scan new files. So that's nice. So you can put this in a cron job and it will be nicely optimized. And many options for original selection and prioritization. Oh, and there's an S in prioritization. So this came from a European source <laughs> or a Canadian. Um, can handle very large file sets, including millions of files. And it has a colorful progress bar. Oh, that's that's useful. It's, it's so colorful. It's colorful. Okay. <laughs> have you tested this out? Did you try it? So, yeah. yeah I actually uh, tested it out because I, I have a need for it. Uh, I have uh, a, a data server that we have plunked on too many backups to. 
<laughs> and I have just, yeah, duplicate, duplicate backups from the same machine over iterations of installations of Windows. <laughs> and I just suck, I just sicked it at uh, one directory. Um, I'm trying to remember all the stats. I think there was like around, uh, about 40 or 50,000 files in that directory. <laughs> and it, uh, yeah, it makes a nice, uh, did it, did it mention that? Yeah, it makes an output of what you can do. So it doesn't do anything to the files that it finds and everything else. It basically makes you a command file that you can go through and edit and review everything uh, that it wants to do. So whether that's, you know, um, so you talked about broken user ID, broken group ID. So if, if like the parent directory has uh, different permissions in the files, you know, it's generally broken. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and like, I didn't run it with, uh, sudo or anything else like that. So it must be able to say that, you know, these are broken or something like that. Cause it's like, I can't read these files because of the user group permissions. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, it does give you a nice, cool little summary. It tells you kind of while it's going, what it's finding. And then at the very end, it gives you a summary of, you know, I found this many duplicates, uh, you know, this many strip binaries is broken links, blah, 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 blah. So it gives you like the breakdown of, you know, stuff that it found. And even in my one little, one little path, which doesn't even cover the terabytes of crap that I have, <laughs> uh, you know, I found like 13 gig of, uh, just duplicate files that I have. And it's mainly like pictures and stuff like that. Cause I think I had photo albums <laughs> synced across the same computer. But, um, but anyway, it runs really quick. And, uh, if you have a large amount of files, obviously it's not going to run really quick. It's going to run fast in reference to how much you shove at it and of course how fast your IO is and everything else. Um, it is command line. There is a GUI front end for it that you can run. I don't know if that's an advantage except for somebody that doesn't want to run the command line version. Um, but, uh, yeah, it did run really well. I did not, uh, I did not actually do the deletes that it requested, uh, cause I'm, I'm still just kind of reviewing it. Um, because I have not just those backups. I have a whole other directory that has probably, you know, 15, 20 years of backups. <laughs> and so, so I have lots of work to do. <laughs> I'm really looking for something that eventually I can sick at it and actually just reorganizes everything that's there. That would be really cool. But <laughs> I haven't found that tool yet, but I found this tool just to kind of look at the, uh, <clears throat> the, the deduping and, and everything else, which is, you know, semi-critical unless you have unlimited space. I still have about, I don't know, 10 terabytes free, so I'm, I'm okay for now, but, uh, it would be nice to clear up some of that junk. Um, but yeah, check it out. It's a uh, RM lint. And, uh, yeah, if you have a directory like I do that you just dump garbage into, <laughs> it might be, uh, it might be something you want to run at it and take a look at what it could possibly, uh, you know, you know, give you or tell you what's going on with that directory. Um, yeah, it, 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 it's interesting. Interesting for sure. All right. Very good. Um, I've got a few file systems I could probably throw this at. So I'd be interested to see what it comes up with, even if I don't do anything about it. Yeah. That's the nice uh, part. <laughs> yeah. Sounds good. I like it. So thanks for that. And let's move on to Linux in the ham shack. And we're going to send it back over to you after your uh, editorializing on RM Lint because you're going to, uh, editorialize about Pop OS. Yeah, so uh, I took uh, Pop OS uh, 2204 uh, based on the latest Ubuntu LTS uh, with all their hacks, as we just heard a few minutes ago, and uh, gave it a spin just like I did with the uh, Fedora 36 beta. I figured, hey, apples to apples, I'll, I'll take a look at this. Um, I haven't used the new Pop OS uh, uh GNOME updates that they've been doing. You know, they've they've changed the GNOME shell quite a bit, added some customization, including they have their own little dock and everything else. Um, so overall, I, I really like the the way it looked. Um, but you know, we we take this thing out for the for the ham radio side of things. So I I did my usual install all the uh, ham radio pure blend stuff. All that stuff looked pretty good. A um, couple oddities. Uh, CQR log. Uh, Installed the uh, uh, MySQL DB, so it broke. Did not work out of the box. So that's uh, sad, sad panda for uh, for uh, Ubuntu based builds. I'm sure that's going to be the same in the LTS build of um, of Ubuntu. I have not tried the beta for that, but I mean, I'm assuming it's going to be exactly the same. <laughs> um, and what was the other thing? 
JS8 call had a weird devel version um, in the repo as the repo version. And I thought that was strange because normally they're not tagged devel um, on the version numbers when, <laughs> when they're actually released <laughs> into the, into the repo for production use, uh, especially on LTS stuff. So I'm not sure exactly if that package is coming from uh, the Ubuntu side or where that package is actually coming from. So that was kind of odd. And uh, there was no SDR++, so that was sad. No SDR Angel, even sadder. Uh, so, yeah, um, I gave it a, a 4.0 on the readiness score if it were released as that. Well, no, 4.0 if it were beta, which it was beta. So it scores a 4 if it's beta, but like if it's in the same state when this comes out to a full release, it's going to be a 3.5, uh, just based upon the fact that CQR log breaks out of the box. Um, and, uh, yeah, JS8 call is not running the, the actual main, well, the general availability branch or general availability build. So I don't even use JSA call. So I mean, I, it doesn't really matter to me, but for everybody else that <laughs> could possibly use it in ham radio world. Uh, yeah, I, th- I would think that's kind of an important thing that it runs well. Otherwise you'd have to get the deb and install yourself, which, you know, adds complexity to something that, you know, if you can do it in five, you know, quick little commands on the command line, you're done and ready. That would be even better. But yeah, so, uh, not looking too great. Uh, again, we're going to be getting pretty close here. Next couple of weeks, we're going to have the full release of, of, uh, Fedora 36 will be out. We'll take another look at that. And Ubuntu, uh, 2204 LTS will be out. We'll take a look at the Ubuntu builds, uh, as soon as, uh, they come out. And that will probably be some of the ISOs that we have ready, uh, for, uh, Dayton Hamvention or Xenia Hamvention or just Hamvention. I guess they want to be just Hamvention. Uh, so we'll have those ISOs, uh, built. Uh, so if you have a preference on which ISOs I master after LTS is released, uh, send me some notes or requests and we'll go ahead and master those out. So they have all the uh, ham radio stuff already in it. Uh, normally I do Zubuntu just because, uh, it uh, has XFCE and it's pretty lightweight and runs on most computers. We'll probably do, uh, you know, a Gubuntu or Gubuntu. <laughs> I guess it's Gubuntu. Or just a regular Ubuntu build as well for everybody that wants that. Uh, but, yeah, any, anything else, I, I'll, I'll look for it. Maybe Mate will come around again. We'll do that one. I know Mate just put out their beta builds as well. So everybody's putting their beta builds out. And, uh, obviously as soon as the LTS is minted, then, uh, we'll be in a stable state to look at everything in, uh, in complete detail to see, see exactly what works. And if, uh, if CQR log is broken in those, I'll try to build it in a way that it's not broken on the master disk. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, cross fingers. All right. Sounds good. I haven't had a taken a look at Pop OS in a while, but might be worth throwing this into a VM and see how it works. Yeah, it's, it's, it's nice. I like the, uh, the updates they did to the GNOME. Um, definitely like the doc. I'm a big fan of a doc. So I did get, uh, maybe I'm not used to using the workspaces in that, but I, I got to a state where, yeah, I, I didn't know. I couldn't, I couldn't switch back to the workspace, but I didn't know if that was the VM just breaking or what. <laughs> so I basically just, you know, did the, the usual control up backspace and. <laughs> Have a restart a session. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I just got to a point I didn't know what to do. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I'm not a, I'm not, I'm not a big workspace user just because I, I have multiple screens. I don't need workspaces when I have more than one screen. But for those of you single screeners, you might need the workspace for that. All right. Very good. Well, that brings us down to the end of the Linux in the Hamshack segment and to the end of our main segments entirely. Which would almost end the show, but we have to bring Cheryl back in here to do the social media roundup. So let's bring her back in here, and she can go down the list. And apparently Facebook was on fire the last few weeks. So so good luck with this. Thanks. (laughs) So the beginning of our list is our Patreons. And on that list, we have Reginald Addo, William Large, Steve Anis, Andy Cowley, Gary Tibbetts, David Scarf, David Slaughter, Jim Lawson, Patrick Eng, Douglas Schock, Brandon Rozak, Michael Burdak, John Spriggs, Robert Lewis, Robert Pitts, 
David Jakeway, Cubicle Nate, Samuel Vimes, Peter Caffrey, Don Rhodes, Paul Griffith, Jonas Rulo, Donald Gover, Herb Garcia, Steve Metcalf, William Heckelman, Randolph Smith, and Andy Webster. For our subscriptions, we have Vincent Martin, Paul Mooney, Craig Kryson, Chris DeLuca, Eric Muller, Carl Backus, Isaac Gear, Thomas Foy, Michael Burdak, Kevin Ivey, Tony Coberly, Ronald Ike, Johnny Kinsey, Fred Cole, Bill Piotr, Robert Halliday, Wayne Hill, John Clark, Steve Hepler, Michael Jopling, Howard Dittmer, Todd Bowers, Michael Carey, A. Taylor, Dylan Engel, Jim McKenzie, Bill Collins, Robert Black, Darren King, Randolph Smith, Robert Yerke, Steve Biela, Alan Wilson, Mark Farrell, and Jeff Zimmerman. On Facebook, we have James Yoder, Butch Weber, Keith Gottwald, George Howard, Hal Mandery, Mike Reed, Rick Lee, Chris Kalkuhon, I'm guessing, Justin Crawford, Mark Humini K, uh, Malik Davapana, Davarpana, Mike Ketchens, Lee Schultz, Teal Nicodemus, Frankie Hunt, Hank Halleck, Scott Cross, Frank Patel, Josh Rollins, Lee Hinch, Ronald Plain, and Steve Wiebke. On Twitter, we had at LowWSWR, at DarkDemon0000, at Pino Signor, at K4HPY, at AsHot underscore, at WeChiaPi, I'm going to guess that's right, and at Infinite underscore S Game. On YouTube, we had VA30S0, SO? No, uh, OSO. <laughs> okay, OSO. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> too many numbers. I, yeah, too many <laughs> numbers. So, um, <laughs> at, uh, excuse me, D. Artagonin? D'Artagnan. It's yes, D'Artagnan from, from, from Three Musketeers. Gotcha. And Jonathan Phoebus on Discord, we had Dr. Volt, Jeremy, Terrapos, RGB405, C2V2, and Curio Critters. And, of course, nothing on the mailing list and no merchandise sales. All right. And we had folks in the chat room today. We had Tony, K4XSS, and Don, KC9ZMY, and maybe others, but they did not make themselves known, so we don't know. But that brings us down to the end of the show. So that's it, I guess. We should probably go along our merry way and let you go and hope you have a great week. And we'll tune in for the next episode, which, of course, will be the Weekender. And you will want to tune in to The Weekender that's coming up because whether or not you enjoy The Weekender content, there will be some announcements in there of interest to all. And so make sure you at least check out the first half of The Weekender that's coming up, episode 464, because important news will be carried within. So stay tuned for that. And again, hope you have a great one. And thanks to everybody who listens to the show and who supports us financially and helps keep the lights on. We really appreciate it. And we wouldn't do this if it weren't for all of you. And we hope to see you in Hamvention in a very short time now. We're down to what a month. Yeah. A month. So, yeah. So we're looking forward to it. Hope to catch you all there. And in the meantime, have a good one. And we'll talk to you next time. This has been episode number 463 of Linux in the Ham Shack. I'm Russ, K5TUX. I'm Cheryl, W5MOO. And I'm Bill, NE4RD73. Hey, Cheryl, what's going on? Thank you for listening to this episode of Linux in the Ham Shack. LHS is a community sponsored podcast. Our website is located at lhspodcast.info. You can support the podcast by visiting the LHS Patreon page at patreon.com stroke LHS podcast or by using the contribute list on the homepage. We have a presence on Discord, Facebook, IRC, Twitter and YouTube. You can also drop us an email at info at lhspodcast.info or leave us a voicemail at one nine zero nine. NHS show. That's 1-909-547-7469. Visit the online LHS merchandise store at shop.lhspodcast.info for fun and fashionable show themed merchandise. Until next time, remember to always heed your hedonism.